Welcome to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Roundtable Panel Discussion. I'm Caitlin Clark and I'm joined by three renowned plastic surgeons and ASPS members. Dr. David Schaefer, who is a board certified plastic surgeon in New York City, specializing in surgical and non-invasive treatments. Dr. Katerina Gallis, a San Diego-based plastic surgeon who specializes in breast and body contouring, and Jason Posner, a board-certified plastic surgeon who practices in Boca Raton, Florida. And we're all here today to discuss how to navigate trends in plastic surgery. Dr. Schaefer. More and more women and men are choosing to change their physical features in ways that are both temporary and permanent. Do you think this is often because of what they're seeing on Instagram or social media? Yeah, definitely people are seeing Instagram, social media. They've also been spending the last two to three years during the pandemic looking mm -hmm. at themselves in the mirror more, mm -hmm. looking at themselves on Zoom and saying, I need to change this, what can I do? And so it's definitely been a huge impact on what patients have been thinking about and now they're coming in to try to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Posner, there was an article in New York Magazine recently about how influencers are starting to all look the same because they're getting the same procedures, some of which are incredibly niche, like the dimpleplasty. In your opinion, and perhaps what you've seen in your practice, is there a mix of trendy procedures that a majority of patients are requesting? You know, we get these, you know, bursts of people asking for cat eyes or something stuff, but it usually doesn't last very long and it's back to bread and butter. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same thing that we always do in our practice, breast, body, face, eyes, lasers, mm -hmm. standard stuff. But you do get these flashes of things that last for a little while and people ask about it. But just as soon as they flash, they, they, they go down. Mm -hmm. Does that make you nervous to then perform those procedures? No, because usually we kick them out. You're like, That's <laughs> how, really you no. how do you say no politely? I'm old, I can do that. <laughs> no. I, I, you know, you kind of redirect them a little bit. Like, that's not a good idea, but, you know, your skin kind of really looks pretty bad. Let's maybe work on your skin instead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the best things we can learn, especially as rheumatoid surgeons, is to say no. And, and I think yeah. it's important. Mm -hmm. And how often would you say you say no to patients? I'm maybe 10% of the time. Okay. And it may not be no completely, but they may come in thinking they want something. And then you talk to them about their expectations, their goals, and maybe there's something else we can offer to give them that they can do. Mm -hmm. I, I say yeah. no like all of, every day. All day. <laughs> do you really? I mean, well, you know, you're doing no. fillers and like you're cut off. Come back in a couple, of, come back in a you month. You don't want to overdo yeah. it. Or like, or surgeries, you know, like too many parts. Like you're not doing all that in one sitting. That's true. And I don't care what you want. Yeah. You can go to someone else to do that, but I don't think that's safe. And, and sometimes you say no, and then they come back a month later, they mm. went to somebody else mm. and got it done, and now they want you to fix it. I like it because yeah. we charge double to fix exactly. those things. You should. You should. <laughs> I think it's, it you should, uh, take a line from improv and say yes and yeah. so you can say yes but you're actually saying no to that specific thing that it's too much surgery or too mm -hmm. much filler it's usually mm -hmm. a too much problem I mean, right the goal is you want to have a happy patient so if they're coming in wanting something that's not going to look good on them or, mm -hmm. or have side effects that they're not realizing then it makes our life difficult too. Absolutely. So I want to make sure that I do something for the patient that's going to make them happy so that they keep coming mm -hmm. back and they're you know, happy with their result. Dr. Gallus, when a patient comes to you and provides an Instagram photo as inspiration for their desired look, is that cause for concern for you? Um, I don't think it is because I think most people are on Instagram and that's where they look for their inspiration. And mm -hmm. I think it gives you a general idea of what their goals are. Um, I often ask for look, uh, look pics um, I had a patient who came in who wanted a natural breast augmentation. Mm -hmm. She's saying natural. I have an image in my head what means natural. And I said, well, do you have any pics you're, you know, that you see? And so she pulls up Instagram and they're not, absolutely not natural. Filtered to the max. Well, yeah, not filtered and just much larger than mm -hmm. my interpretation of natural was. So that's fine. It made sure that we're on the same page. So I think it's helpful for that so that I have an interpretation that's on the same page with the patient. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, and then if they show stuff that is totally unrealistic that you know has been filtered or doctored or whatever it is, or you know the angle is just quite right, or it's an on table, mm -hmm. that's a hard one to come with the on table. Um, OR photos. Yeah. So, you know, it just it doesn't show the end result. It just shows an immediate result. Um, then you can, ex that's a good time to educate the patient about what's realistic. Mm -hmm. And setting expectations. If they don't look like the pre op in the picture they're showing, you, <laughs> that's there's true. no way they're going to look yes. like the post op in yes. the picture they're showing. Yes. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And you can point that out like, oh, well, this patient's much taller thinner or not thinner or has a wider chest, um, mm -hmm. maybe he's had a few pregnancies versus somebody who's never had, you know, it's clearly like a 20 year old who's never had yeah. kids, those yeah. sorts of things. So I like it when the 65 year old brings in 
pictures of 18 year olds. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> we <laughs> all want that. You're a little older than that. Yeah. I, I, I had a patient one time and she said, I just want to look like my picture. And it was like an old fashioned picture, like yeah. her head shot. And I turned it over because when you used to get film developed, they'd print the date on the back. Mm -hmm. It said 1979 on the back of it. Oh, <laughs> so there's no way we're going to get just like that. Yeah, we can make improvements. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Right. But that being said, if they're bringing in that photo, I think it's helpful because you can you can't turn back time to turn them into that, but at least your goal is going to be like not overcorrect the eyes Definitely. so that it looks not like she used to, yeah. you know, like it's it kind of a, a natural uh, yeah. result. And that's especially important in facial rejuvenation mm -hmm. because when people come in for facelifts, we do a lot of fat grafting. Mm -hmm. So I always say to them, you know, I'd like to see some older pictures to see if you were fuller or thinner because you don't want to take someone who had a thin face their whole life and plump them up and look terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it helps sometimes to look at the volume of the older patient. Yeah, Definitely. that makes sense. Dr. Schaefer, beauty standards have been evolving since literally the beginning of time, but is there a sense now that trends are even more temporary now than they were before? That they're more fleeting than they have been? I mean, definitely there's a lot of trends and it does have to do with social media. It also has to do with the media cycle. Because we get called by editors and like, what's the latest trend? And they don't want to hear about the kind of the bread and butter stuff that we do every day. They want mm -hmm. to hear what the latest laser is, the mm -hmm. latest procedure is. So that's what the article is about and that's what's being marketed by the companies. Right. And so there's always these new things being talked about. Like but what you said earlier, it's the bread and butter or tried and true procedures that we do that mm -hmm. really are the tested procedures and make a nice difference for patients. Totally. I was hearing a lot about this dimple plasty. You know how Miranda Kerr has the dimples and a couple mm -hmm. other celebrities have those dimples and people are going to get their cheeks indented with this mm -hmm. dimple plasty. Now, is that something that you're reluctant to do procedures like that because they're so niche and they're so trendy that perhaps they're more fleeting? Well, I'll tell you a personal experience. A patient came in and I thought they were crazy. They wanted these dimples. <laughs> and I'm like, why? You're so beautiful. You don't need it. She's very interesting. So we did it and actually looked good. So, really? uh, you know, and she was happy. But, mm -hmm. uh, but so sometimes you might think that, that it's not good and the, the patient knows their body better, better than we do. So that's mm -hmm. why we partner with the patient, talk to them about their goals and expectations, and then come up with the plan for them. Mm -hmm. And now, Dr. Posner, it's not a secret that Instagram and social media have kind of shortened our like collective attention spans. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a goldfish, three seconds. <laughs> except in the opening. <laughs> You're doing better than most. And so what, um, what happens when today's trends kind of become tomorrow's throwback Thursdays? You know, it depends what you're looking for. Like one of the big trends has been, you know, BBL, buttock augmentation. Mm -hmm. Now there's a nice article I read the other day and we're seeing, we're actually in the middle of an article about reversing those. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of these trends, you, you gotta go with your gut. If something doesn't feel comfortable for you, don't do it. I mean, I don't like these huge butts. I don't think it's appealing to me. And I, uh, I knew that this was gonna um, go back the other way at some point or other. Right, and so did that make you ever reluctant to do a BBL? Do you perform those in your practice? We, we do. My partner does more than I do now, but you know, we don't go crazy. We're not, we're 50 miles north of Miami, so we're not seeing those huge yeah. Miami butts yeah. that they want. So it's more, uh, you know, a, a more subtle approach, at least in our office for that. And so now that Finn is in again, I've been reading those stories as well. What are a patient's options to reverse a procedure that maybe they're kind of sick of, they don't want anymore. Depends what it is. I mean, 70% of my practice at this stage in my career is secondary. Okay. A lot of secondary breasts, a lot of secondary faces. Faces are generally secondary because they're older. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a face of 10, 15 years ago, they want a little tweak. But a lot of the breast cases are, are, are relatively difficult. A lot of capsule contracture, a lot of droopy things. So you know, there's a lot of revision. So we have a lot of newer options in 2022 to address some of these problems. We have new lasers, we have meshes. So I mean, pretty much I don't do a lift anymore with a lift with implants without mesh. Got it. But, but it is important to get the surgery right the first time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you can you can reverse the result, but if you're not taking them back to where they were before they had surgery. There's things you can do, but incisions, I tell patients, you can't erase those. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always gonna be there. Once you have surgery, you've made a change. So we can make improvements, we can fix some of the areas, but they also have to know they're making permanent changes to their body. Right. Right. I mean, your, your point on that is, you know, people looking for surgery the first time should go to someone relatively experienced and with a decent reputation. Don't go to the cheapest. Cheapest is generally not best. <laughs> no, yeah. right. stay away from the sales. And I think that's, that's, we're talking about two different types of revision surgery, right? So there's the person who went somewhere and had an unfavorable result. And again, it's important to seek, seek out a board certified plastic surgeon maybe not travel overseas where you're not going to get follow-up mm -hmm. um, for your care so that it's right the first time and it meets your goals. And then there's the revision surgery, like I had this done 10 or 15 years ago. I need a tweak to my facelift. 
Um, I've aged, I've had weight changes. And I think you have to go over all those expectations with the patient at that initial surgery, mm -hmm. um, just so that you can say, hey, we're gonna do this BBL, this buttock enhancement. Um, just know over time, this is what's gonna happen to the fat. If you change your mind down the road, these are your you know, potential outcomes. Mm -hmm. Just like with breast implants, you know, this is, you know, bigger isn't always better. Right. I remember the Pamela Anderson breasts were so super popular in the 90s and early aughts, but it's now- It's really hard to correct. Because yeah. now, because right, you would have the sagging skin even if you wanted to remove them. So would you have to do a lift or how would you correct that? Yeah, so a lift is usually the answer. Mm -hmm. um, because that skin has been stretched out and um, there can be some other changes. And I think breast implant revision surgery and even, even whether you're downsizing or removing is one of the more complicated things that we do because you really have to predict what the skin envelope is gonna do, what the breast is gonna do, and, um, and you've altered it already. Mm -hmm. Once with the implant and a second time with aging and weight changes, maybe pregnancies, those sorts of things. And, and, they, and there's two of them, so you have to have yeah. symmetry. <laughs> there's two, <laughs> there's two. I, I, I would say it, it doesn't matter exactly what you do, but you need to make sure you do the same thing on both sides. <laughs> right. And you know, a lot of menopause, you know, we've seen a lot of women who have had implants and whatever when they're younger, they go through menopause, they gain some weight, usually the breasts get bigger, and now they want to downsize. So mm -hmm. very common, at least in my area, where the people are getting a little older. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, are you finding that now, instead of the larger breasts, people are looking for smaller, more athletic looks? Like the more, I would say overall, that's a trend I've seen. And I do a lot of breast revision. So people who had breast implants done maybe five to 10 years ago, usually have larger implants. And then I have another category of patients who had their implants in 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they're, they have small implants. So despite how old the implants might be, they're a little bit easier to work with because they're 250 cc's. Mm -hmm. And that was the trend back then. And then it trended larger. And now I think we're going back to um, smaller. I'm completely all across the board. I have really? some people who want huge implants and some people who want small implants and mm -hmm. get to offer whatever they want. Right. <laughs> that, that, but what you said is bring in pictures. The pictures yeah. absolutely yes. help of what their goals are because sometimes they say, I want to be a B cup and they bring in double B's. <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> it's true. It's so subjective too, to your point of what is natural. You know, right. your natural may not be my natural. Right. And I say I'm the full C MD because everybody <laughs> wants to be a full C. It's just that's, that's what true. that is, right. is different. But right? there's no standardizations to cup size. No. Oh, no. yes, even amongst the bra companies. So patients are like, oh, well, I want to. I don't want to be too big, I want to be a full C. Or if they're coming in for a reduction, I don't want to be too small, I want to be a full C. And no matter what, like that full C looks di is a different interpretation for every patient. And That's it'll true. look different on different silhouettes and body frames as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schaefer, are there any trending procedures that you just won't perform? You know, most, most procedures I'll perform if it's appropriate for the patient. You, you mm -hmm. do get some crazy requests from patients sometimes, but, it's, but generally it's w within reason the patients that we're getting. Mm -hmm. so, but I don't know, are there any crazy things that you've seen lately coming in? I haven't seen too much crazy stuff lately. We yeah. really haven't. I think people have been very reasonable. You know, the people you see are much better educated than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know, That's right now I just mentioned something. I say, listen, go home, Google it, do some homework, and then come back for a second yeah. console. But we mentioned things. A lot of times they'll come in with one thing they'll come in okay I want this device mm -hmm. and I, I always redirect them I say okay let's I let's talk about the pro let's all the time they want body tight they want Ruben I say let's figure out the problem and then mm -hmm. we'll give you some potential solutions to that problem yeah yeah that makes and sense then they go homework I mean yeah. people are very educated now they will do their homework so mm -hmm. yeah. you know I enjoy that I like that much better than someone who's really stupid yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did have one patient that wanted their tongue split down the oh. middle so they have two little tongues I never even heard about that uh, and I googled it and sure enough, people get their tongues split down the Did middle. You do that? I would not do that. <laughs> yeah, so there's a whole sub niche of body um, modification. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I personally don't do that. And there are a few uh, plastic surgeons who offer those, but those are That's like crazy. the kind of things that I um, fixed a few of those. I took a star yeah. out of someone's forehead. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, they had like a some kind of solid an implant, silicone huh? implant. Mm -hmm. I just wow. made a little incision and pulled it out. Yeah. Looked great. Did it, the skin contract yeah. or did yeah, it? it was yeah. young. The patient was yeah. younger. Mm. Did fine. Okay. Interesting. Well, that, that's the beauty about our field, though. It's like behind the door, it's always something new. You, yeah. you never yeah. know what you're going to get when you go in. Yeah. And then we have all these tools, and then we can be creative and how to yeah. address the problem. Well, that's what I like about our specialty. I mean, the people in our specialty are generally very creative. Most of people like new technology. So you know, a lot of forward-thinking people. It's not like in general surgery. This is where you take out a gallbladder. Yeah. Right. You know, there's a it's lot of fun stuff. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> We're in a fun field. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. And now, Dr. Posner, filler is an example of a popular procedure that isn't going anywhere, but it's very easy to overdo it, quote unquote. 
which invites very real consequences into the mix. What are some of the dangers of over-injecting a patient? You know, it's two parts. It's the patient and it's the physician. So when the patient's asking for more and more things, I tend to try to stage them. So I'll do a little bit and I say, that's enough for today. We'll let, let it settle, come back in a month, and we'll talk about doing some more. The other side of it is the overzealous physician who's thinking with their pocketbook and not with the patient's mm -hmm. best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And I think people should avoid those doctors mm -hmm. because really, you know, what's going to happen is it's not going to lead to long-term business success. You know, you need to, they, they told me this in medical school, you know, don't do anything to a patient that you wouldn't do to a family member. Yeah. And if you keep that in your head every single day at work, you'll do a good job. I like that. And, and one thing, you said doctors, but a lot of the people injecting it are not doctors yeah. and right. not core physicians, not even medical people sometimes. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> right? so, so it, it's really, it's mm -hmm. really difficult. So a lot of these like filler problems that you're seeing aren't necessarily from doctors, or sometimes they are, but you know, again, looking for a qualified, trained, board certified plastic surgeon, you mm -hmm. know you're gonna be in good hands. Right. And I think pictures, again, uh, are important. So I think if you're staging fillers, which is something I do, you have before and after photos. And so people forget what they look mm -hmm. like, and they just, you know, it's a slippery slope. You think you want more, and you, you can say, hey, let's pull your before photos, let's look at your after photos, and then, um, you know, maybe this isn't the next best, like you don't need more lip filler, mm -hmm. you don't need more cheek filler, because then you start to look distorted. But for the patient, it's a slow, it's a slow transition, right? They were swollen, then the swelling goes down, they get used to it, so they think more is appropriate and they forget what the original was. Mm -hmm. There's a new company and it offers the patient the ability to do at-home imaging on their iPhone. Oh. So they can do face and breast imaging, reductions oh. in li and, and implants, but they can do facial fillers, so they can actually morph themselves. So I think yes. it'll be interesting when they start doing that and coming in with seeing what they're interested in. It might be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's not so easy, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gallus, but it's not so easy to reverse filler. You know, you can dissolve it, but it's, it's trickier than what it seems like, right? Um, I mean, I think depending on the type of filler, it's fairly easy to reverse, although there have been cases where um, it's a little bit more difficult to get all of the filler to resolve. So um, most fillers are hyaluronic acid based, and so um, we can easily reverse those. There are some other ones that are less um, able to reverse. So it's important to, again, have that conversation with your plastic surgeon mm -hmm. about what's being injected. What are your options if you don't like it? Um, I feel like jawline filler is one of those things that's trendy on Instagram, mm -hmm. but you have to appreciate that to get that you know sharp jawline, we're adding volume to your face. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the, the pictures on Instagram are of this like side profile and then you never see the forward because their face is wider. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you're talking to the patient about that and then saying, you know, we can do this, but if you don't like it, this is the option is to reverse it. Mm. One, one thing I often tell patients, we don't want to solve one problem and not mm -hmm. cause another problem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yes. Now you have this really nice jawline, but you now you have this really wide <laughs> right. face. You look like right? a chipmunk Somewhere. a little so bit, you, right? You, you want right. to make sure you have a good balance. Mm, totally, yes. totally. Now, Dr. Gallus, do you have a personal philosophy on um, how to navigate trends in plastic surgery? Like, is there anything you won't do, anything you are a little hesitant about? Like, what is your philosophy? Um, I think it's, you know, it, being a plastic surgeon is trying to find that balance of offering the patients what's the latest and greatest, but also not jumping on every trend. So I'm kind of down the middle of, you know, interested in learning about what else is out there mm -hmm. and then doing my research and learning about it at like conferences and national meetings and then t talking to the patient because just because it's new, it might not fit their goals anyway or their mm -hmm. expectations and um, kind of staying open minded. Yeah. And Dr. Posner, how about you? Do you have a philosophy? Yeah. You know, I, I think you, you said that quite eloquently. I mean, I think most of the patients coming in are not asking, again, for stupid things for me, but they're asking for things that we don't have optimal solutions for. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you know, mm -hmm. arm laxity that don't want to break your plasty or lower leg laxity, there's certain things or devices that are now coming to market that might have some solutions. So that's sort of my research interest, things that we are not able to solve mm -hmm. currently. Now, what about an arm lift? Would you just have a terrible scar or is an arm lift one of those trendy things that you don't really 
are going to be. If someone needs a brachioplasty, they need a brachioplasty. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of patients in between that are not the best candidates for brachioplasty. They could get benefit, but they don't want the scars. So, I mean, all our lives, what we do in plastic surgery is trade scars for results. <laughs> That's what we do. So we have to figure out what the, the best kind of medium for that is. Mm -hmm. But there's new stuff coming. There's lots of new tightening devices. We're definitely in a different position in 2022 than we were in 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and I suspect in 10 years from now, we'll have even better technology. And yes. combining surgery with the non-invasive, we've really been able to up our game and, yeah. and achieve yes. have better results than just surgery or just banana right. mm -hmm. I mean, I rarely do a liposuction now without some tightening technology, mm -hmm. yeah. right. which is part of the process. Mm -hmm. And do you have a personal philosophy? So I partner with the patient and I talk to them about their journey. So it's not just to come in, I'm not a drive through where they just get one thing and then go. <laughs> but I talk to them about their goals and mm -hmm. expectations. We prioritize what they want to have done. And then we start on that journey. And so I want to keep seeing them back. And, and work with them to get to their goal. Have you ever had a moment where, as you're considering um, maybe an oddball request, where you're thinking, ooh, maybe I shouldn't do this, maybe it's not gonna be so popular in a couple of months or a couple of years? Well, the, you know, the best thing is to know when to say no, like we talked about, mm -hmm. and, and giving the patients other options. Because mm -hmm. what you don't wanna do, and you learn this throughout your career, is get forced into doing something that in the back of your head you're saying, I really shouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. because it's gonna be a lot of problems down the road. And then you have the reputation of being, you know, the the overly plumped plastic surgeon, and yeah. that's not a reputation that yeah. anyone wants. Really right, either. you have to remember that your patients are representing you when they're mm -hmm. out in public, and so, I think that's important too, mm -hmm. so. Definitely. And what you were saying about different aesthetics as well, you know, your aesthetic isn't necessarily the next person's. And so, you know, you have, you know, a collective patient population who comes to you for your aesthetic. Would you say that that is accurate? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, listen, people, I think people are pretty reasonable these days. Mm -hmm. You know, no one wants to be pulled. Mm -hmm. Okay, I heard Rod Rourke say this once, you know, nobody wants to go into witness protection for a facelift. <laughs> I mean, people come in, they want to look like a younger version of yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't want to look different. Right. I think you just need to explain that to the patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and making sure why they're having the plastic surgery, because sometimes they have other issues in their life and they think changing something about themselves is going to solve all their problems. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Figuring that out before you do surgery instead of after. It right. <laughs> and plastic surgeons aren't setting, you know, the beauty standards anyway. You know, the patients are and, you know, social media is and, you know, the culture is. So to say that I feel like plastic surgeons are setting on these unrealistic, you know, expectations of beauty isn't exactly fair. Would you agree with that, Dr. Gallup? Yes, I would agree. I feel like um, we have far less control over what the standards are um, than maybe 20 yeah. years ago. Um, there are some aesthetic guidelines or standards that we all have been trained in, um, you know, the nipple position, the, you know, right at, you know, some ideals for a nose, but it all has to be done in the context of that patient, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important that we consider that and that the patients also realize that because not everybody is starting from, you know, a Kardashian and those, those people don't look like they do anyway, <laughs> with their, you know, like there's so many layers there to unpack, so. Mm -hmm. And we have a special role in um, almost being gatekeepers mm -hmm. and the safety for the patients. And yeah. like BBL is a good example right now, where it's kind of getting out of control. And now yeah. we're saying, wait, we, we need to start looking at this, how it's being done, what's going on, and, you know, maximize mm -hmm. the safety for the patients. And how would you reverse a BBL? Well, if they've had, let's say, uh, fat transferred into their butt, you could do liposuction to take it back out. Interesting. But just like when you have a large implant and you take that big implant out, now you're going to have extra skin. So that mm. there's a limit to how much you can do for reversing different procedures. Got it. Got it. Do you have anything else to add? That was good. Yeah, Covered was good. a lot of good. Right. We did. Well, thank you so much to the three of you for joining our panel today. And that concludes our panel. Thanks. Thank you.